so good about Good Friday? Well, stay tuned. Kingdom first. Good night to Clarice McGarrell of uh, Farika. Great few ministries down there. Good evening to you, Annie de Griffin. Sandra Richards. God bless. Good night to the headmistress, Yvette Angelo Archerson. How are you doing here, Tim? God bless. Ron Canoli back in the day when he rocked the house like Mickey Mouse. Great music, relevant even to now. Got the kingdom beat, your kingdom shall reign. Kingdom first!
your matchless works. Nobody can match it. No one comes close. I am God. Beside me, there is no other. What a boast. What a truth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you. Your words are forever settled in heaven, and the entrance, when it enters in, it brings life. Let there be light. Let information flow. Break the barriers of darkness. Penetrate the dark kingdom with your light, with revelation knowledge. Open the eyes of the people's understanding and let them see clearly what thus said the Lord. This is our prayer in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. Let it be. Hebrews 2 and 14. I'm reading Hebrews 2 and 14 and then I'm going to read uh, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, sorry, 15, 1 Corinthians 15 and 54. Hebrews 2 and 14. Insomuch then, Hebrews 2 and 14, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, the children of the kingdom, the Lord's people, they have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, speaking of the Lord Jesus, likewise shared the same, the same what? Flesh and blood. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. The devil had the power of death. It was handed to him by Adam. Jesus is on the scene now. And through his death, being the death of Jesus, he will destroy him, Satan, who had the power of death. So now Satan is not going to have the power of death anymore. That's why he came. That's what makes the Friday so good. While the fear of death is a universal fear, Jesus came to destroy that fear. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a song mind. Stay with me. I'm going to connect the dots tonight, tonight. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Because we were all afraid of death all our life, we were subject to the bondage that fear brought, the fear of death. Because we were afraid of death, as long as we lived, the one thing at the back of our minds were, I wonder when my day would come. I wonder if I'd be ready to go. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. And death, because of the uh, unknown element of it, the day and timing and how you're going to stand with God, people are terrified of dying. Hugo Chavez, who famously said of George Bush, El Diablo was here when he went to the United Nations to give his speech. El Diablo was here, I still smell his sulfur. And when it was time for Hugo Chavez, the president of Venezuela, then to die. He said, I'm not ready to die. I've got a lot of things to do. I am not ready to go. And many people, powerful men and women of old, and in our day and time, have said the same thing. I am not ready to go. I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready to give up. I want to live some more. I want a few more years. And sadly, very few of them had that request granted by the Almighty God. When their time came, it is appointed unto men once to die. They had to meet their appointment with death. For indeed, Jesus, he does not give aid, assistance to angels. He didn't come to die for angels. But he gave aid to the seed of Abraham, the children of Abraham. Father Abraham has many sons, has many sons that Father Abraham I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right hand, left hand, right foot, left foot. Turn around, touch the ground. You remember we used to do that back in the day. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, made of flesh and blood, that he might be merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make propitiation, to make us friends with God again, to pay the penalty that was to be paid for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he's able to aid those who are tempted. Because he went through the temptations that you and I went through, he has the ability to help us when we are going through our own temptation. We're going to read one more scripture, 1 Corinthians 15 
and verse number 54. I'm going to read verse 50. I like to get text and context and not just make read one scripture and tell you what it means. And instead of rightly dividing the word of truth, I end up with pretext. So we want text and context so we will not end up with pretext. A lot of times, preachers want to make a point or name a sermon. They read a scripture, rest the scripture, tear it out of its context to make it mean what they are preaching about. But <laughs> that's not the way it works. Scripture must interpret scripture. And so sometimes I say I'm going to read this particular passage, but I read the ones before it so you get the gist. You get the lowdown. You get to suss it out. So here we go. 1 Corinthians 15, I'm reading from verse 50, but verse number 54 is our salient verse, the one with the bite, the one with the power. Are you ready? Here we go, 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So you and I are flesh and blood, so we cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So what has to happen? We have to change. And Thessalonians tells us that we shall be changed from mortal flesh and blood to immortality. Jesus says, come and touch and handle me and see. Because a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. He didn't say anything about blood there. Flesh and bones. And the kind of body that he had, he could travel at the speed of thought and pass through walls. Come Thomas, and touch, and feel, and see, and put your hand in here, and see that it's me, and not somebody else. He was letting them know he had a glorified body. That's the kind of body that we will have. Not this one that's aching, and paining, and squeaking, and, you know, your back goes out more than you. <laughs> I'm going to have some fun tonight, too. Where was I before I was really interrupted? Yes. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Behold, pay attention, take notice. That's what behold means. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That word sleep there means die. But we shall all be chained. And when he says all, he's talking about all of the believers, not all of everybody. Because I had a, a, a pastor, I used to have tremendous regard for this man of God, this bishop. Next thing I know, he's saying that everybody will be saved. Those who receive Christ, those who don't receive Christ. Christ paid for the sins of the world. His blood was shed for everybody's sins. So if you sin today or sin tomorrow, the penalty was already paid. So everybody's going to heaven. I was so shocked. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The whole minute, hey, 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 yo, yo, yo. Yo, come, no, that's not how it goes. You can't live like hell and go to heaven. But that's what he was saying. I had to drop him like a hot potato, meaning not listen to his teaching anymore because he was off the reservation. He was off the rails. He had gone off in a deep end. He was trying to be extra biblical. Aside from what the Bible said, he had come up with this fantastic teaching. and uh, But instead of it gathering a larger audience that he thought it would gather, the real believers started leaving his ministry. And he had thousands of people at that time. It whittled down to a couple of hundred and then he figured out, look, this thing ain't working. But it was too late to apologize. Too late. It was too late. <laughs> oh, my dear God. What a sad thing to see that man who, you know, supposed to be right now the premier voice has become nothing but a whisper. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, die, but we shall be chained. How fast will this change happen? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. He's talking about the dead in Christ. Not every dead, only the dead in Christ. Sometimes as a preacher, you better explain to the people, because they'll hear you say that. He said, you know, the dead will be raised. So whoever is dead will be raised. So I will be raised. I'm, I'm going to heaven, and they start rejoicing. No, you can't make that scripture mean what you want it to mean. The dead in Christ shall rise, because another scripture tells us that. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up after the dead in Christ. Nobody else is getting up from the dead until later on, and they have a resurrection for the judgment at the great white throne. 
we have a resurrection at the judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. Our judgment is to determine what rewards we will receive. Their judgment is to let them know, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Go to the place prepared, not for you, for the devil and his angels, but you chose to go there. And so I'm letting you have your choice. It's a bad choice. And I have told you through the voice of many preachers to not make that choice. But you had to have your way, didn't you? You made a mock of my people, didn't you? You laughed at the Bible. You laughed at the preacher. You, 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 you mocked and jeered at eternal life. And because your other friends laughed along with you, you thought you were the cat's meow and the dog's bow wow. You had a great time making a mockery of my word and my church and my people. And now, here you are having to go where the devil has gone. And I'm saying it loud and clear because today's preacher, you don't hear them warning people of eternal damnation because it's not kosher to say that. And of course, in 2022, you know, you can't say certain things because we have democracy right now. <laughs> oh God, our helping ages pass. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible, he's talking about his body now, shall have put on incorruption, change, and this mortal, the mortal body, shall have put on immortality, it's changed in the twinkling of an eye, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Victory has swallowed death. So whoever it is that is coming to make this change, this transformation, he is going to kill death. He is going to put death to death. What nonsense are you saying, preacher? I'm telling you the truth. That's what makes this Friday so good. Somebody put death to death. Hmm. And it's not like he is fighting to come out of the grave. It's death trying to keep him in. But as the hymnologist says, Death could not keep its prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph o'er his foes, he arose the victor from the dark domain, death, the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose <coughs> greatest story rarely told he had victory over death and lives forever with his saints i am he he said that liveth a and was dead was past tense and behold pay attention i am alive forevermore and now i have the keys of hell i can open it and let out who i have to let out and the grave Hell and the grave and Satan don't rule death anymore. I'm the master of the domain of death. Why? I am the resurrection. Glory to God. I feel a rock of sucker coming on. O oh, death, verse 55. Where is your sting? This question Paul is asking and saying to the Corinthians in a mocking tone to death. Like, oh, you used to be the bad guy. You, Mr. Death, you were bad like yours, but now we have cured your yours. We have a solution to death. You can't keep the dead in Christ dead anymore. You can't keep them in the grave. You used to keep them before, but not anymore. Now they will rise. I am the first fruits of the dead. And if I'm the first fruits, there's a second fruit, third fruit, fourth fruit, fifth crop. A lot of people, millions of people will be raised up from the dead. To live forever and ever. So let it be. O Hades, where is thy victory? Now here's an interesting piece of scripture. After all of that is said, here's the crux of it. Here's the salient point. Now pay attention, you're going to learn something tonight. I'm sure of it. Oh, you're just arrogant. No, I'm just confident in the word of God. Don't be mad at me because I believe the scripture and you don't. 
you know I have a problem with this Bible. It was written by King James. It's King James Version. And the word version means perversion. King James didn't write no Bible. You know that for a fact. So stop lying. He authorized. <laughs> the sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gave us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Over what? Over the sting of death. We have the victory. We have the victory over death. Yes. Death can't keep us in the grave. No. That's why it's Good Friday. But I'm not done. I'm now, I'm now just uh, skimming the surface to get into the teaching. So here I go. Meaning, I'm starting now. All of that was just icing on the cake. But you don't eat the icing alone. You eat the cake. And if you got enough sense, you will dump the icing. Just eat a little tiny piece. Because I read a book that was called The Bitterness of Sugar. I was shocked that this sweet thing had so much bitterness attached to it. So here we go. When man ate the fruit in the Garden of Eden... He lost something. In order for God to restore to man what he lost, we have to figure out from Genesis 1, what did man have and what did man lose? And once we have figured out what man has lost, then we know what it is that Christ came to give back to man. That's what's good about Good Friday. We lost some things, plural, and Christ has come to give it back to those that want it. That's why it's good. So what did we lose? I'm glad you asked. So here I'm answering the question. Number one. Uh, Genesis 1, 26. And God gave man. Here's what he gave man to know what he lost. Dominion. That word dominion means kingdom. He gave man kingdom, rulership, mastery over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, everything that creeps on the face of the earth. He gave man the responsibility to manage the earth. Man would be God's representative down here on planet earth. So man, when he fell, he lost dominion. That's what God gave him, meaning he lost kingship. He was king of the earth, man was, but now he's not even a prince. Because he handed over responsibility of the earth to a snake. The last time God saw him, in the cool of the day in the garden, God would come walking. God was in charge. The next time God saw him, a snake was in charge of the garden. He said, how you make this snake fool you? You were there with your wife when the snake was talking to her. Why didn't you get a stick and whack the snake? <laughs> man lost dominion. The second thing that man lost was the kingdom of heaven. The God, the king of this invisible kingdom in heaven was ruling over man and man was ruling over the earth. As long as God was king, the kingdom of heaven was supplying whatever it was on earth that man needed. Even the information to name the animals was given to Adam by God. God didn't call out the name. God put it in him instinctively. So when he saw the animal, he said giraffe. Why? The word giraffe popped up in his head. And being made in the image of God, he could not be wrong because God was giving him information. What a blessing. God was in him. Remember? After he fashioned man from the dust, he blew his breath into man and man became a living soul. So this spirit being called man was given this earth, dirt, mud to live in. This body is mud. Whether your mud is, is brown and pretty or your mud is blackish blue, or your mud is fair and you call it white. Whatever your color is, you're still mud. I know you're pretty, but you got pretty mud, but it's still mud. I know you're ugly. You got ugly mud, but it's still mud. At the end of the day, pretty or ugly, black, white, or polka dotted, everybody is mud. They are a spirit living in this mud house. Your body is nothing but a mud house that your spirit is living in. I know you think you're hot, but all you got is hot mud. It's going to cool long after a while. Everything will start sagging and bagging and falling all over the place. And then you're no longer perky and pretty and handsome and hunky. You used to show your, your 26 guns and your six pack. You'll show one keg 
And when you do like this, ain't nothing showing there but flab and a string hanging from the bottom of your hand, shaking in the wind. <laughs> you know that time is coming, so don't pretend with me. Man lost dominion, eh? <laughs> and man lost the kingdom of heaven. B, so that's two things. But not only that, he lost the kingdom of God on earth. He was ruler. He gave man dominion over all things. But now it's too late because the men have lost their faith. A. Hey, eating up all the flesh from off the earth. Me na know how me and them I go work it out. <laughs> of course, Brother Bob was talking about pig meat and stuff like that, but the first part he got right. He gave man dominion over all things. But it's not too late. Men have not only lost their faith. Some of us have regained our faith in God. And we don't eat up all the flesh from off the earth. We are not cannibals. Are you feeling us? We are not scavengers. Man lost dominion. Man lost the kingdom of heaven. Man lost the kingdom that God gave him on earth. Now a snake is in charge, a demon is in charge, a fallen angel is in charge of this earth that God gave to man. When he was tempting Jesus, he said, the kingdoms of this world are mine and I can give it to whoever I want. If you fall down and worship me, I will give it to you. Jesus didn't call him a liar. He was telling the truth. Jesus referred to Satan and called him the God, common G, of this world. He's running this world's system. You know it's so. Every nation... Their, their politics, their laws and rules are basically satanic. Wicked laws running every country in the world. Evil laws. Every nation. They call it righteousness, but that's not what it is. Not only did man lose dominion, the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of God on earth. Man also lost the eternal life that God made him with. Those guys used to live 900 years easy, 800 years easy. Imagine. Even though God told Adam, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. It took Adam a long time. Death started working in him. One day he got up and he sneezed. And he wondered, what happened? I never used to sneeze. Then Eve started coughing. What happened to Eve? The power of sin began to operate to kill man. God doesn't lie. Satan knows one thing about God because remember, in eternity, he used to live with God. He was the anointed cherubim that was in charge of music and, and culture and worship and everything else. The arts and everything, that was his speciality. He knows that God does not lie. He knows that God told man because he heard a man telling his wife, in the day that we eat from that tree, we shall surely die. For God said, we shall not eat of it and we shall not touch it. The serpent heard that. The devil heard that. And so what he said within himself was, I got to get them, man, to rebel against God and to eat that fruit. If I can get them to eat that fruit, death will start working in them. So I can get them to die. I can kill this creature that God has made. But Satan did not have the power of death. That was in God's domain. And man had the key to unlock death and to give, give death life to kill him. Man lost eternal life. So he lost the kingdom of heaven. He lost the kingdom on earth. He lost eternal life. He lost dominion. Not only that, he lost his connection with heaven. He lost the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit does not dwell in unclean vessels. And that act of eating was an act of rebellion against the kingdom of heaven. What Adam was saying in that act was, I no longer subject and submit to the rulership of God. I am following this snake. I'm rebelling against heaven. I want a new government to run this earth. The government of Satan. <coughs> so now that he has sinned, his body is no longer a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to take leave and come out of his body. He does not dwell in evil, in sinful bodies. 
This is where the story of the blood shed on the cross for us is, is relevant. Because the blood is the cleansing agent to make your temple suitable, fitting again for the Holy Spirit to come and dwell again inside of you. Jesus said it this way, it is expedient, necessary that I go. For if I go, do not go, the comforter will not come. But when he is come, he will lead you into all truth. Yah, yah, re, re. Why? As long as I am here on this earth, I am at one place at one time. But when he, the Holy Spirit, comes and comes inside of you to live in you, he can be in all the nations of the world at the one time. But I don't have that omnipresence. As long as I'm in this body, I can only be at one place at one time. Man lost the Holy Spirit. He lost his connection with heaven. The Holy Spirit had to leave because his body and the body of his wife was no longer the temple of God. It became a place for demons to come and go as they please. Man lost his connection. What did man get? Well, I'm only going to highlight two things that man got. Your creative brain can go in several directions. What man got was a snake to be in charge. And the second thing man got was death. He got death. He got to die. And he got a snake running the government of God on earth. Of course, it's not no longer God's government. It's now Satan's world. And he has been doing with it whatever he pleases from then to now. Until Jesus came with the uppercut herd around the world. Today on Good Friday, Satan will receive a slap herd around the world. Wink, wink. And uh, the Lord was not slapping the other guy. Neither was the Lord will. The Lord was going to have his way and do his will. Are you feeling it, brother? So those are the things that man lost. It's a very simple message, but sometimes it takes forever. Because people are not paying attention. And sometimes as the preacher... You got to break it down like a fraction. Tonight I'm a math teacher and I'm breaking it down like a fraction. Half of 100 is 50. Half of 50 is 25. Half of 25 is 12 and a half. Half of 12 and a half is 6 and a quarter. Half of, you understand? You can take it down to the lowest whatever. All right. Now let's answer another question. This thing about death. Number one. Satan did not create death. In fact, the joker didn't create anything. And I say the joker very respectfully because Satan is a formidable opponent. He's not some, someone to toy with and play with and mess with. He has access to heaven. He, he, imagine that. God has a convention. Satan attends the convention asking about his servant Job. And you have a heads around him. And if you move the heads, I can destroy him. And he's only serving you because of what he got from you. The Bible describes Satan as the accuser of the brethren. He accuses the brethren before the throne of God night and day. You can't be an accuser of the brethren night and day if you're not in heaven night and day. Satan has a place in heaven. And Revelation tells us Satan and his angels fought. And Michael and his angels fought. And his place was no longer found in heaven. But that's way into Revelation. That's when his place will no longer be found. But until then, between now and then, Satan has a place in heaven. We're like the prosecuting attorney. He constantly hurls accusation against us. And some of us make his job easy by doing all kinds of crazy stuff that we know God has forbidden us from doing. Man gained death. And man got a snake to be in charge of what God had given to man. So I made my first point with regard to death. Let's highlight death now. Satan did not create death. He's not a creator. He's a created being. Jesus was there when Satan was made. In fact, it was Jesus who made Satan. By him, John 1, were all things made. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him, Jesus, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God who came to bear witness of that light. He himself was not that light, but had come to preach about that light so that men through him might believe. He, the light, came to his own, the Jew. His own, the Jew, receive him not. But to as many as receive him, the Gentiles, to them give he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that shall believe and call upon his name. By him were all things made. By Jesus were all things made. 
And without him was not a cockroach that was made. So Jesus was the creator of Satan. Created him an archangel built into his body. Musical instruments. Huh? And decked him out with all kinds of precious stones in his body. And he was walking among the fiery flames of heaven by the throne of God. He got his position of closeness to God by virtue of his high rank in the arts, music, and worship, leading the heavenly choir and being the musician and the music. He did not sit down at a keyboard to play. He was a keyboard. Built into his body were all the sounds of music. And when he moved, he could have music oozing out of him. And on top of that giftedness for music, he was given a definite anointing. Now, number one, you're highly skilled already. And then you have the anointing, the enabling of the Holy Spirit to come on you as you, as you ooze music. My dear God. The Bible says he was exceptionally beautiful. This creature, Lucifer. But he got, he got the big head. I will ascend on the sides of the north. I will be like the Most High God. These guys are going to come down and worship me. And in the midst of heaven, a perfect environment, Satan was able to convince a third, one out of three, of the angelic host to join him in this rebellion against God. That just shows the tremendous influence that Lucifer has. He's no joker. He is no joker. Don't play with him. Don't dance with the devil. You can't win. He has about 7,000 years of experience dealing with men. And he has done dirty to every last one of us. The only person he could not get to fall into his trap was Jesus. Everybody else fell. Hook, line, and sinker. Are you feeling me now? Even the mighty Elijah got suicidal talking about kill me and blah, blah, blah. I'm not better than my fathers and I'm the only one left and all that stuff. Even the mighty Elijah. The great Moses, the prophet of the Old Testament, had a temper problem. Striking the rock. Me and my brother Aaron brought water out of this rock. And God says, you know, you still got that anger problem. You can't go into the promised land. I got to kill you here, bro. And I'll do the funeral myself. Nobody's coming to this funeral. All these years I've been dealing with you in that temper. You went, you killed the Egyptian. You buried him in a shallow grave. You went off for 40 years with your father-in-law. All of that 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 man taught you. And you still haven't learned. There are Christians like that. They haven't learned. All these years they're still the same miserable wretch. But now they're a church wretch. They used to be a sinful wretch before the Lord met them. And they met the Lord and claimed salvation. Got baptized. Joined a church. And they are as wicked as the days long. Still wicked like they were before. And, and sometimes I talk to some of them and say, you know, this is how the Lord made me. And I'll stay like this until I die. They don't want to change. I'm blaming the Lord. This is how the Lord made them. The Lord is guilty of no such thing, of making you such a rebel, because he has told you and me and us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And in due season, he will raise us up. He has said in his word, he resisted the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Are you feeling me now? He said, pride goeth before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. He can't give you one word here. And then contradict all that he said. By giving you this angry attitude. With everything and everybody. All these years. And you still go to church. Some of the biggest liars I've met. Are people that go to church. They won't stop. They lie with a dry face. And they lie and convince others. That what they're saying is the truth. 2021 I met some liars man. In all the years that I've been in church, and this year would make it uh, uh, 43, I think it is, 42, 43. I got to check it again. And last year, I met some liars. I met some liars, church liars, pastoral ministry too. Two of the biggest liars that I met last year, pastors. And they wouldn't stop. Even to now, they wouldn't stop with their lies. What kind of a Christian are you? And they blame God for making them like that. God, he make nobody like that. You have made yourself that lying thing. Because lying, a lying tongue is an abomination to God. And God will not make you abominable. Come on now. Talk to me, talk to me. So God says to man, look, all of this stuff I've given you here. But in the day you eat from that tree, you will die. It's the first time that the word die 
is introduced to Adam. He said, what is die? You will stop living. What do you mean stop living? I've got eternal life. Yes, but there is this thing called death. If you eat of the fruit, you will give life to death. Because I have created something named death. I have built it into your life. But death can't touch you. The only thing that will activate death is sin. Sin will give life to death. Because when I made death, I made death dead. So death is in you. But it's dead. But if you sin by eating the fruit, you will give life to death. And death will come to life in you and kill you. Whoa. Let me go that again. God gave me eternal life. But built into the eternal life that God gave me is this thing called death. Yes. Death is in me, but God created death dead. Yes. So I've got a dead thing in me called death. Yes. But if you sin by eating the fruit, you will give life to death. And death will come alive and kill you and Eve and all your descendants. And once you have released death that is inside of you, all of your children will take on your nature, all have sinned, and all will die. The wages, the payment for sin is death. So Adam, if you want to retain your eternal life, you must not eat that tree and rebel against me in sin. For in the day you eat it, you will give life to death, and death will awake in you and kill you. Whoa. That's a mouthful to consider. God established a family of sons, spirit sons on the earth, and he established a kingdom and gave man rulership, dominion, kingdom, he created a kingdom, not a kingdom of subjects, but a kingdom of kings. Not a kingdom of slaves, but a kingdom of kings. He, God, had a relationship with man and had his representative inside of man, the Holy Spirit. As long as man maintained his pure life, the Holy Spirit would give him the mind of God and be the connection between man and God. But if man sinned, he will lose that Holy Spirit, lose that connection. Oh, glory to God. God wanted to extend his heavenly way of doing things on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. God wanted his son, Adam, to influence earth. Adam was to take the mind of God that was given to him by the Holy Spirit that's inside of him and influence earth from a heavenly perspective. He must multiply, subdue, have dominion. And replenish the earth. That was God's plan. He wanted man to have eternal life. He wanted man to have communion with fellowship with him. He wanted man to have the Holy Spirit. He wanted man to have a kingdom on earth. Like his kingdom in heaven. Along comes the snake. Influences the woman. She takes up the fruit. Influence the man. The man ate. As soon as the man ate. Now, all the eating that Eve did, we don't read of anything happening, but the moment man ate, their eyes were open, they saw their nakedness, they started running and hiding, and God says, I've got to kill an animal now to give them some clothes because they are naked and ashamed. And so blood has to be shed to cover them. And that's the story of redemption. Blood has to be shed to cover us from our shame of sin. So here I go. I'm starting a second time. This is part B of my start. <laughs> Once man sinned, God had a problem. The problem was called sin. But not only did God have a problem, God had a solution. This thing that was activated by Adam, this dormant thing called death, that was made dead but given life through man's sin, God had to defeat death. So that all of the men on the planet, it's about 7 billion or 6 billion some plus counting, heading to 7 billion now. 
He can find a way to defeat death. His son must defeat death and give that victory and gain that victory for humanity. God must find a way to make death powerless. Oh yes. Death must be powerless over all those who choose to follow God's way. Amen, amen. He, God, must find a way to take our sin so that we no longer have it. Since sin is the thing that gives power to death, if we don't have it, then death has no power over us. God has to find a way to take the sin from off of man and leave man without sin. There has to be a way. And God found a way and Jesus said, thundering through the corridors of time. I am the way. But how does this thing play out? Now pay attention, you may learn something. The fear of death is a universal fear. All men have some degree of fear of death. Why? Because death has a sting. There's a finality to death that makes you have chills. When you think of death, you are nervous and tense and uptight. You wonder, when will death come for me? I wonder if I'm going to be ready. And what kind of an eternity am I going to have? Death was created by God. Death was created dead. Only sin could give life to death. Once you sin, death is given life. And death will kill you. It is appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. And so because of that, death wins. No one can stop death. None can resist death. All will die. No one can avoid death. You could drink mineral spring water, go for a run every day, practice all the health practices, and eat yourself fruits and vegetables. You're still going to die. Death has zero respect for the high and mighty. Death has zero respect for the low and humble. We all go under in a cemetery somewhere. It is appointed unto men once to die. Now hear and hear me strong. Death does not come from Satan, so he does not have the power of death as long as we don't live according to his dictates. Death, when it was created, it was created without power. But sin gives death its power. Now all have sinned, so all are sinners, and so all of us give power to death by our constant uh, sinning against God. Oh yes, sin gives death power. Jesus must now come, Good Friday, to take away the power of death, to take it away from death, so he can ask death upon coming out from the grave, death, boy, I got you. Where is your sting? Grave, you hold everybody else, but you couldn't hold me. Where is your victory? And not only did you, what was it that you couldn't hold me, those that believe in me, you will not be able to hold them either. And the devil laughed because he knew we have sinned and sin gives power to death. And once we sin, he has power over us through death. He didn't know Jesus had already found a way. And I'm going to tell you the way today today. Hang with me for a while. You're going to get this message. And so, death when it was created, I repeat myself, was not created with the power to kill. It took sin, rebellion. That's what sin is. It's a rebellion against the government of God. It took sin to activate death, to give death life, to make death live, to make death live, to kill. Because that's what death was there for. For the rebels, to kill the rebel. Don't touch that tree. Don't eat of it. You will surely die. God was the one who introduced Adam to the concept of dying. Mm -hmm. And yet with all of that warning, death was given life by man. That day you eat of it. As long as you don't touch it, it can't kill you. If you activate it by rebellion, you're going to die. Are you feeling me now? Once death killed and began to kill man off, Cain killed Abel. That was death at work. Once death killed, a solution had to be provided. But God had a solution before the problem arose. The only power that death has is the power we give it. Man gave death its power by sinning or rebelling against the government of heaven. The power of death is sin. Sin gives death power. The key to destroying death, therefore, 
is to take away the power that death has. What's that power? Sin. Sin is what happened that gave life to death. And death came alive. Sin brought death to life. If we can get rid of sin, we can get rid of death. Jesus was now God's secret agent that came with a plan the devil couldn't see through to get rid of death and to get rid of sin at the same time and to relieve the sinner at the same time and to rise from the dead and kick death in the teeth and take away the keys of hell and death. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of A, hell, and B, of death. It was a masterful stroke on God's part to come up with this plan to free the sinner while he's alive to keep the sinner from staying dead after he is dead to raise his son back to life on the promised day the third day to show that the story that Jesus came to bring was a true story and he was the one and only sacrifice that could be made because of his sinless life and his spotless blood are you feeling me now? Oh, yes, yes. And that's where we read Hebrews 2 and verse 14 and 15. Man, this human, this dirt, this ish. Now, ish, man is called ish in the Hebrew. And that word ish means spirit being. But I thought you said we are mud. We are. We are a, a, a spirit being with a mud house. This that you see here on this uh, Facebook Live is my mud house. It's dark in color. It's got a lot of uh, moles spattered all around it. It's got some teeth. <laughs> this, this is my earth suit. The, band, the preacher from Bahamas would say, this is your earth suit, Dr. Miles. This is your earth suit, your dirt house. Man is the one who sinned, Adam. And so God must pay the penalty to a man. A man must pay. Now because we all have sinned, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And since all have sinned, all must die. But here God, I can't let them die. What do you mean you can't let them die? They sinned and therefore they must die. God says, yes, but I love them too much. Who? Man. The angels are there they're asking a question. What is man? That you are mindful of him. What is man that your mind is full of him? What is the son of man that you visit him? This weak creature down there on earth. You constantly thinking about him. Finding ways to bless him. Finding ways to promote him. Finding ways to be nice to him. What is man? Why are you so fussy over? What is this great love you have for these creatures that don't obey you? God says man I just love my kids. <laughs> you parents will know what I'm talking about. Sometimes your children behave in a way you just want to strangle them. But what are you going to do? They're your flesh and blood. Sometimes you look at them and they're wrong. You just have to sigh. Like, you mean, I want you not to do this. And you know the children of today, whatever it is you want them not to do, that's what they're going to do with impunity in front of you. <laughs> now you know how God feels. Imagine all these billions of people on the planet and let, let me say, uh, Enoch walked with God, and he was not. God took him. Uh, we have a case of Daniel walked with God. We have the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking with God. We have the case of Joseph walking with God. And we have the case of Jesus walking with God. Everybody else in Scripture messed up big time. Just those six people. Six billion plus people on the planet, only six stayed close with God all the time. The rest of us, <laughs> and a preacher used to say, we, we wicked till half left. I don't know what he meant by we till half left, but as he, he's, what he meant was, there's no stopping our nature to do evil. You don't have to teach children to be rude and disrespectful and unmannerly, but you have to teach them, say good morning, say the magic word, please, and thank you, and excuse me. Imagine that. The nature is there from small. The rebellious nature is there. We all have it. Don't, try, don't write me no notes and tell me your children are not rebellious. You have the best children on the planet. I know. Keep them to yourself and don't tell me about them. I don't want to hear about your little angel that you got. And look at Buford. He's such a great kid. He never did anything wrong. Yeah, right. 
I don't want to hear. God bless you and them perfect children that you got over there. Mm. I love my children too much. I don't want to kill them. They deserve to die for their rebellion, but I don't want to kill them. We have to come up with a plan. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. A man died, his name was Jesus, to satisfy the justice of God. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. Surely he bore our sorrows. And by his stripes we are healed. He paid the death he did not owe. I owed a death I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus came and he washed my sins away. That's the solution right there. So let me explain. He, God, became a man, the, re, the, the, the incarnation. He must satisfy the justice of God. He must take away the sins of humanity. And through his death, he must destroy death. He must take away our sin. He must pay the price to satisfy the justice of God. He must destroy death by rising from the dead and showing that he has the power over death. Satan had, H-A-D, the power of death because he had, H-A-D, the power of sin. He, Satan, instigated rebellion against God that give death life. And Jesus must get rid of sin to destroy the power that death had. Now because the wages of sin is death, all who have sinned must die. So we must die because we have all sinned. We have settled that already. But the other point is, and here is the crux of the matter. Christ is sinless, so you can't kill him. Death can't kill him. Because he did not sin. It takes sin to give death the power to kill. Here is a sinless man. And death can only kill the sinful. It cannot kill the sinless. But Jesus had to die. To put death to death. To kill death. To take away the sting of death. How is this possible? And here was the trick that God pulled on that serpent, that lying snake. Jesus said, all right, death can't kill me. But death can get a hold of whoever has sin on him. So this is the trick I'm going to play. I'm going to go to man all across the world. I'm going to take all of man's sin and put it on me. Now remember, he did not commit any sin. But he's a sin gatherer. <laughs> he gathered all the sins of humanity and put it on him. And when he did that, the father who was a part of the plan all the time turned his face. That's the heinousness of sin. That's how evil sin is. That it took that brutal beating and crucifixion. God was showing his disfavor for sin. He was showing how wicked, how evil, wicked, mean and nasty sin is. That in getting rid of it, he had to send his only begotten son to take a licking out of this world. There was no beauty in him, said scripture, rocker, sucker, that we should behold. Ah, I feel the anointing of the Lord standing up in my soul. Hey, 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 hey. Give me a moment there. Give me just one moment in time. I gotta plug in my, my microphone and...
It's a lot of an anointing upon the audience. If I can feel it here in this chair, you can feel it there. I don't know how God does it, but he does it. So here's the trick. Jesus gathered all the sins of humanity and put it on himself. The father looks down and turns his face away from his only begotten son. Why? Because he's not even seeing his son. He's seeing all this sin. That was my alarm. I have an alarm that goes off ever so often in the day that tells me it's time to pray. So that's one time, you know, you might hear it a little on the, on the live. It just is a reminder to me that when I'm not on and that alarm goes off, I say a quick prayer or a slow prayer, or whatever. When you hear it, it's not some intrusion from the powers that be. That's me. That's my doing. And it's not so marvelous in my eye anymore. My God, my God, he says, why have you forsaken me? We, we planned this. That I am the, the lamb slain from the very foundation of the world. When you made the world, you had this plan in place in case man chose to rebel. Why have you forsaken me? But notice what he said. My God, my God. He was still his God. He's not saying total stranger. He acknowledges that God who had forsaken him was still his God. My says, still his. He, he claims God as his personal God. You know, when things go wrong, a lot of people don't claim God anymore. Why would God do this to me? It's not fair what's happening to me. God is not hearing my prayer. God is not answering. I'm, not, I'm going through a rough time. I don't think God, and they get all mad with God. And like Job's wife, they want to curse God and die. Jesus took all of the sins of man. And when death saw that, all the demons of hell saw that and said, look, Christ, the king, he's covered up in sin. Let's catch him now and kill him because he has sin on him. Now, he didn't have sin in him. <laughs> he had sin on him. And the devil used that opportunity quick. He got the Romans and everybody else, the Sanhedrin council with an illegal trial by night, Whoever conducts a trial by night. But death was in a rush to kill him quick before he catch himself and cast off all this sin that's trying to hold him. And death killed him. But he had said before, I will rise again. Are you still there? Now here is the clincher. You can't try a man twice for the same crime. Once you find him guilty, that's it. That's one. Number two, once Jesus took the sins of the world on himself, once he took my sin, he took it from me, then I don't have it. Are you understanding the thing here? When Jesus rose from the dead, the devil was shocked. Like, whoa, he, 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 we got him with all that sin. You mean he's, he's back from the dead? Yes. But not only that. He looked across at the, at the, at the people that believe in Christ, and he saw, hold a minute, where is the sin that's on them so we can not only kill them but keep them dead? Well, Christ took it. Christ Jesus came and took my sins away. So now that he has taken our sins away, from what? From us. If he has got it, our sins, then we don't have it. What? Our sins. Ah, oh. so he's got it. Yes. So I don't have it. No. Have you repented? Yes. Well, he has taken it in the sea of God's forgetfulness. That's where we cast our sin. And so now, even though we die, death can't hold us in the grave. It can't, death can't keep us dead. Because when that trumpet sounds, all who acknowledge that Christ is the one who is a sin bearer and has taken their sins away, all of them, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And if we are still around, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But it doesn't end there. He not only solves the problem of sin and solves the problem of death. Now because his blood can cleanse us when we ask God to forgive us and wash me in the blood of Jesus. Now the Holy Spirit who left Adam, remember? Because remember before Jesus went up, he said to them, he blew on them and said, 
receive ye the Holy Ghost. Oh, the word re, the prefix re means something is happening again. The word sieve means to have. Receive means to have again. When did we sieve or have the Holy Spirit? In Genesis, when he breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul. Whoa. So now the Holy Spirit can come back and have residence in us because we are cleansed, washed by the blood of the Lamb. And now the scripture teaches us our body is the temple of God. So the Holy Spirit can dwell in us again. Whoa. So now the connection that Adam had with God, we can have with God again. Whoa. Not only do we have the connection and the Holy Spirit used to come and go in the Old Testament, come upon and leave, but he was always on the outside. Jesus said, the spirit that is with you shall now be inside of you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost now. So now you have the contact with God. Okay. But it doesn't end there. Now you are reconnected by the power of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God, the invisible kingdom that is in heaven, is back. Back where? Back governing you. You're now listening to what God is saying and doing it. So you have regained your connection with the king of the kingdom. You have regained your connection with the Holy Spirit, who is the paraclete. Remember that word? Nice Greek. We used to do that in Bible school. Paraclete. Parakletos. We used to talk like, like we, we were Greeks. So. <laughs> what a beautiful time learning that scripture. Eh? It pay, it's paying off now. It's paying off now. You... Your mind, sometimes you hear other preachers and as you hear, you connect all the dots that were disconnected and discombobulated in your brain. I couldn't explain it like this many moons back. But I got it, finally. I get it. I understand. I, I know what I'm talking about. We have reconnected with the kingdom of heaven. And not only that, we have also reconnected with the kingdom of God on earth. This earth territory. This land on planet earth and we are given the keys of the kingdom the ways and righteous dealings of god are for us to instruct and inform and to teach the nations we are to influence earth because now we are the light of the world we are the salt of the earth we flavor things up when we come around as a child of god we have regained the holy spirit we have regained the kingdom of heaven. We have regained the kingdom of earth. We have Death has lost its, its, its dominion and mastery over us. We are no longer under the snake's command. We are going to live forever. Eternal life is in us now. And now when we submit to God, we can resist the snake and he will run from us. That's the good news of Good Friday. All of this happened by the death of Christ and his burial and his resurrection. He said, what's good about Good Friday? A man died. It is better for one man to die and for millions to live because that one man died than for millions to die and everybody stay dead. Are you feeling me now? That's what's good about Good Friday. It's not about the cross buns. It's not about eating fish on Good Friday. Are you feeling me now? It's not about dressing up in black and singing about the cross, at the cross, at the cross. All of that is good, but what, what has happened to a lot of people is Good Friday is just another religious day where wicked people come to church and, and pretend to serve God and shed a few tears. Oh, Christ on the cross, his seven sayings on the cross. And they go back for the rest of the year and do their wickedness. Then the old year's night, New Year's Eve, they come back to church again and they give God their crocodile tears. And when somebody dies, they come back to church. They can hardly wait for the service to finish. Have you noticed that people don't go to the cemetery no more? They, 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 they just go right to the rum shop after they had the funeral session in the church. It, uh, Good Friday has lost its meaning to, to the church as well as to the unbeliever. They have no clue. It's just a religious day to dress nice, look good, sing hymns, and go back to your old wicked life. But when you understand what Christ did on that cross, you can no longer... For now are we the sons of God. And while it does not yet appear what we shall be, we know that when we see him, we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is. This mortal body shall put on immortality. 
this body that is decaying shall be an immortal body moving at the speed of thought passing through walls going wherever you want to go without having to buy a ticket oh i just love traveling i'm going to be traveling all across the globe for free we shall be changed we shall be changed from mortal to immortality in the twinkling of an eye behold i show you a mystery yeah lord we shall all be changed yeah, when he says all all who believe in the twinkling of an eye my dear god death has been destroyed death has been killed Jesus came and killed death, put death to death. Death can't hold you in the grave anymore. Death thinks it has a sting, but the sting of death was to not only kill you, but keep you dead. But hey, we ain't scared of death because there's a trumpet that will sound. We shall be resurrected to immortal, eternal life. Eternal life works in us now and will manifest itself in the afterlife. When Christ raises us all from the dead, if we die, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? It's a good Friday because the message of this day is a good one. You can have eternal life. You don't have to live like that. Sin does not have to rule you and run you and have mastery and dominion over you. The snake doesn't have to gut you from pillar to post and messing your, with your head and messing with your life. Death can't keep you in the grave. Because the blood of Christ is powerful enough to wash your sins away. Look, that's why Good Friday is good. So all that bloodshed, all that beating, all that that man suffered, an innocent man paid for the guilty. Yes, that's what shocked the devil. It was illegal to kill him because he didn't commit any sin. But they killed him anyhow. You know the system of this world works. Little did they know. Up from the grave he arose. <laughs> Satan lost. Anytime it comes with Christ, and I'm closing now, and death, Satan lost. When the young girl died, and Jesus said, Talita kumi, damsel I say unto you, arise. Satan lost temporarily, but he killed her again. Huh? When the young boy was heading towards the burial, and Jesus touched the place that the boy was on and said, Young man, arise, and handed him back to his mother. Satan lost, but Satan killed him again. Jesus waited another time to show the devil that he had power over death, that he was the resurrection. He don't just raise the dead, he is the resurrection. Four days, Lazarus dead and stinking. Lazarus come forth and he that was dead came hobbling out of the grave. Loose him and let him go. And the Pharisees and Sadducees were seeking to kill Lazarus because his testimony was bringing a lot of people to Christ because a lot of people knew when he died and were there for four days mourning, saw his dead body and then saw him alive and testifying. And they were flabbergasted and began to serve the Lord. And the, the Sanhedrin, they got upset that Jesus was having all these converts. They were seeking ways to kill Lazarus, to kill the miracle. Yeah. You know, there are people like that. The minute God starts to do the miraculous in your life, they want to kill it. If they can't kill the thing, they kill your testimony. They want to kill your good name. That's what they want. They want your reputation. They don't have one of their own, so they want to kill yours. Because your testimony is making them look bad. They don't want to live for God. They want to live half-heartedly. They don't want to sell out like you sold out, like I sold out, like we sold out. And over the years, you have gained this name as one of God's people. They don't like that. So they got to try to tarnish your reputation, tarnish your name, tarnish your image. Because they have no, no image of their own, no reputation of their own, no name of their own. Hmm. 
Lazarus came back from the dead, but Lazarus died again. Jesus said, all right. I got one more dead man that I'm going to raise. and You can't kill him. <laughs> Satan had no clue what Jesus was talking about because Jesus was sinless and Satan knew the rules. You had to sin to die. And this man, no matter how I tempt him, he just wouldn't follow my lead. He wouldn't sin against his father until Jesus took the sins of the world and put it across himself. Satan said, ah, we got him now and killed him. Three days later, the demons went to Satan and said, boss, you won't believe what happened. <laughs> they said, we lost the keys of hell and death. How could you lose the keys of hell and death? That's the one sting that we have over humanity and keep them in bondage and fear. He said, Jesus gone with the keys. <laughs> I just have to laugh the way, you know, I, I am tickled pink with, with Good Friday now because I know what it means. I know the meaning of Good Friday. It's good because Christ took my death, your death. He took my punishment, your punishment. Death can't kill us and keep us dead. We will rise again. Hallelujah for all that Christ did on that cross for us. Not just a song we sing, all the way to Calvary he went. For me, yes, he went. For me, Jesus went. For me, all the way to Calvary, he went. For me, and now he set me free. Although I had so many, many sins, Jesus took them all away. And he pardoned me. Although I had so many, many sins, Jesus took them all away. And he pardoned you all the way to Calvary. He went for me. Yeah, Jesus went for me. It doesn't make you want to hop and skip and jump and shout hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Good Friday is a good story for me. It's a good story for you. It's a true story. It's historic. May God grant you understanding and cause you to walk with the King of glory. Our King put death to death. God bless. The boom is out. Have a good Friday, y'all.